Good evening, and welcome to Forge Road Bible Chapel Zoom for our Good Friday service. My name is Tom Shetlick, and we welcome the Christians from Genesis Bible Fellowship, Brooklyn Bible Chapel, and from other churches as well. I trust that you're safe, that you're healthy, and that you're living in and trusting the grace of the Lord. I don't need to tell you that it's been a very difficult six weeks in America. Six weeks ago today, there were just 19 confirmed cases of the coronavirus in the United States, and none of them in Maryland. Schools were open. Maryland's top 10 basketball team was gearing up for the national tournament, and Everyone at Forge Road was looking forward to going to Genesis Bible Fellowship to continue a tradition that is now uh, 14 years old of celebrating Good Friday together. Today, just six weeks later, the confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States are close to 500,000. And 1,900 Americans died of the virus yesterday. The scripture says that all creation groans, and never before in my lifetime has that been so plainly evident. You can almost hear the groaning in the silence of city streets. The scripture says that all of our wealth, all of our activity, all of our accomplishment, and everything that we think gives us security is exceedingly fragile. Never in my lifetime has that been so obvious, as trillions of dollars of wealth have disappeared in just a few days. The scripture says that death reigns over all of the earth, and we are seeing the ferocity of it. In a sense, we are now seeing the world the way God has long seen it, as a place living under a curse where wealth is an illusion, and where death is a tyrant. But the same scripture continues that wherever sin has abounded, God's grace has abounded much more. And as death has reigned, as death has reigned over the earth, so grace will reign and does reign through righteousness to eternal life and in Jesus Christ. Tonight, we want to consider together the day when sin abounded and grace abounded much more. The day when Jesus Christ took the burden and took the suffering and took the curse upon himself and bore the wrath of both man and God and by his death made a way for us, a way of life, a way of new life and of eternal life. The day when he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now to focus our attention and to make the best use of the means available to us, tonight we're going to consider the seven recorded sayings of the Lord Jesus from the cross. Seven different men will share their thoughts as we step through those hours together. I'll set the scene, reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, let's pray, and then there'll be a hymn that we can all sing together wherever you are. And then our brother Jeff Walgamoth will get, have the first of the things that Jesus then said. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for his great accomplishment. And Lord, as we gather together this evening to remember him and to think about him, 
We pray, our Father, that you would renew our hearts and minds, that we would be bound together with, in love for your Son and in a commitment uh, uh, unto his gospel. We pray your blessings on this evening in, in the many places where we are gathered or the many places where we are not gathered and we are, we, we are with our families. And we give thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. In saying these words while enduring persecution at the hands of his enemies, Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy from Isaiah 53, 12, that he would make intercession for the transgressors. While on the cross, just after he was crucified between two criminals, despite his agony, Jesus' concern was for the forgiveness of those who hated and despised him. From the cross, he could see the soldiers who have mocked, scourged, and tortured him, and who have just nailed him to the cross. He probably remembered those who have sentenced him, Pythias and the high priests of the Sanhedrin, Pilate, 
who himself realized it was out of envy that they had handed him over to him. And in his infinite mercy, Jesus still loved them and would have given them, for it would have forgiven them had they humbled themselves and repented before him. But is Jesus not also thinking of his apostles and companions who deserted him? Or of Peter, who he knew would deny him three times? Or the crowd, who only days before praised him on his entrance into Jerusalem, and then days later demanded his crucifixion? Is he also thinking of us, who daily forget him in our lives? Does he react angrily? No. At the height of his physical suffering, his love prevails, and he asks his father to forgive. Could there ever be greater irony or love? Jesus asks his father to forgive, but it is by his very sacrifice on the cross that mankind is able to be forgiven. What can we learn from this phrase, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do? Because of sin, we too were enemies of God. He is ready and willing to forgive us of our sins. As Jesus' words demonstrate, when we understand the magnitude and the depth of Christ's love for us, we in turn are able to follow his example and unflinchingly love our enemies. Bless those who curse us. Do good to those who hate us. And pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And now I'll pass it to Pastor Wayne for our second segment. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Jesus says to John, behold your mother. And to John, he says, I mean, to Mary, he says, behold your son. In the second word from the cross, the Lord Jesus, we see once again another remarkable example to us of how faithful and compassionate is our Savior. While in the midst of intense and debilitating suffering, Dying for the sin of the whole world, he focuses attention on his mother and his disciple. While dying for the whole world, he is still concerned, caring, and compassionate to us as individuals. We see his concern for his mother. We see his charge to his disciple, and both of those become a challenge to the corporate body of church. Three things I would like you to consider with me very quickly as we look at this second word. Number one, the cross reminded reminds us that it is a place of forgiveness and restoration. Now that might not be clear right up front, but John himself says in the text that, that Jesus, uh, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. But also we must remember that John was also one of the disciples who fled at the arrest of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Matthew uh, 26 uh, verses uh, 56 and also Mark 14 uh, verse 50, that all of the disciples fled. And so what we see now, Jesus is still reaching out to John. In fact, after John has disappointed him and certainly did not stand with him at his arrest. What we see once again is that the love of Jesus Christ covers a multitude of sin. From the cross, he is loving John. His love is patient. His love is, is forgiving. His love is, has great forbearance. His love is restoring and his love is loyal. When he sets his love upon you, the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. In fact, you cannot fail your way out of his love for us. We also secondly are reminded that the cross, at the cross, there is something that Jesus has for us to do. You see, as John sees Jesus bearing him sin or being his substitute, as we look back knowing that Jesus is our substitute, the question is this, is there anything, any justifiable reason that we can say no to Jesus for what Jesus asked us to do? As John sees Jesus being his substitute on the cross, is it too great a thing to be the substitute for Jesus in uh, this world? You see, Jesus was asking John to be responsible for Mary. Jesus being the firstborn, it was his responsibility. He is now asking John to be his substitute to do something for him. You see, things that are important to him should become important to us. Also, things that he needs done, we should be committed to doing them. And then thirdly, 
things uh, that, are, that he's made himself responsible for in this world, we should be willing to let him use us to get them done. We see the cost that was paid for us. But what does Jesus see when he looks at our hearts? Is he, does he see a heart that says yes before he acts? Does he see a heart that says yes before he commands? Does he see a heart that says yes before he gives instruction? Is uh, the heart open to his will? Is the heart open to his ways? Is the heart open to what he wants? Is the heart open to his word? You see, we become in this world substitutes for the Lord Jesus. We become his ambassadors. We become his voice. We become his hands. You see, we become him in action as he is working through us. And so when our Lord asks of us anything, don't we find ourselves sometimes challenged in our hearts between compassion and concern on one hand, but on the other hand, convenience and comfort. There is a struggle that goes on in our hearts about these things. But what should rule? I tell you what should rule. What should rule is the love of Christ. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains us. It motivates us. It, it impels us. I like the NET translation. It controls us. Since we have concluded that Christ died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, listen to this now, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and for them that was raised on, for him who was raised for their behalf. You see, when Christ asks us something, the final determining factor is, do we love him? And not only that, listen, when I look at the cross, I know that he loved me. And so the cross reminds us that it's a place of forgiveness and restoration. Secondly, the cross reminds us that there's something for us to do. But then thirdly, we are reminded at the cross that we become a new family. You see, a new mother and a new son, they are joined together now by their faith and their obedience in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a new relationship joined by their mutual love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he cares for us, we are to care for one another in this world. You see, a new relationship, a new family dynamic is rooted in our mutual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A new family now becomes a new family that will be together forever. May the Lord bless you. Now we will have special music from the Dunkerton family.
Good evening. I'll be looking at the words of Jesus on the cross recorded in John 23, 43, where it says, and he said to him, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. This statement is in response to a thief hanging beside Jesus on the cross. It's important to remember, though, that there are two thieves. Both were aware of their hopelessness. Both were aware of their state as sinners. And both acknowledged who Jesus was. Both wanted to be saved. But Jesus' statement is only to one of them. Tonight, we're looking at many different perspectives during the last moment of Christ's earthly life. John does not record this statement casually. It is for a purpose. I believe he wants us to see the heart of the second thief, the one who not only saw his state and his need and who Jesus was, but also that this thief is penitent. To the first thief, who also knew his hopelessness and that Jesus could save, saw only that, salvation, a way out of his problem. He wanted Jesus to get him off of the cross. He said, save us and yourself. But for him, there is no reply for Jesus recorded. Not a word, no promise, and no hope. But to the repentant thief, there's this beautiful promise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The best possible outcome for the hopeless. There would not be a delay. The day, that day, the spirit of Jesus and the renewed spirit of the thief would be in union in paradise. And as is recorded in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, we're told that paradise is the heavenly abode of God, where there are found things prepared by God for those who love him, things that are utterly indescribable. Better than to be just in a place prepared by God is to be with God himself. Jesus said, today you will be with me. And I think that's the other thing John wanted his readers to understand, the incredible love of the Savior, not just to forgive us, but to dwell with us to love us and to know us, not just for a season and not just for a time, but for all seasons and for the rest of time. What a solace when we leave this world, regardless of the circumstances in which we leave. Our sins are forgotten. His suffering is done. Our union is forever and eternity has just begun. We'll now hear a word from Norris Gorman. Good evening, friends. If you care to, turn to Matthew chapter 27, and we'll be reading verses 45 through 50. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama thabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Let's stop for a moment and consider all that has happened in less than 24 hours leading up to the crucifixion. There was the meeting in the upper room. Jesus and the disciples partook of the Passover meal. Jesus had to rebuke jealousy among the disciples. He tried to explain to them again what was about to happen to him, explain to them about his death. He demonstrated to them what it means to be his follower, about servanthood with the washing of their feet. He warned them about desertion, and denial. He revealed to them that one of them would betray him. He instituted the Lord's Supper and spoke to them of the new covenant. In the middle of the night, he made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and spend time with his father. During this time, he experienced tremendous grief and sweat drops of blood. His closest friends couldn't even stay awake to pray with him. He gets betrayed by Judas a great multitude with swords and clubs arrive and arrest him, and then the rest of the disciples desert him. He is brought before Annas and then Caiaphas, where they bring false testimonies and charges. He appears twice before Pilate. The crowd chooses Barabbas over Jesus. 
He is mocked, beaten, tortured, scourged, beyond recognition. He's, he is humiliated and physically spent. He is then led to Gal Galgotha in broad daylight before an unrelenting mockery and forced to carry his own cross until he could carry it no more. He is excruciatingly nailed to a cross and hangs there from nine in the morning till noon. Psalm 22 verses 13 through 15 said, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. And even during this time, he continues to endure the mocking. Verses 39 through 43 say, from, from, Matthew 20, 50, uh, from Matthew 37, and those that passed by blasphemed him and wagging their heads saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is a direct quotation from Psalm 22, one. It reads, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? and from the words of my groaning. It was during this time of darkness that Jesus had been made sin for us. He had been forsaken by the Father. Can you imagine how hard that must have been? It was the only time in the eternal relationship between the Father and Son that they had been apart. I don't know about you, but for me, one of the hardest emotional challenges I ever face is aloneness. When you have a tremendous burden to bear, when you're the only one who can shoulder a particular responsibility, it can be overwhelming. Now, multiply that weight by what it must have been like for Jesus to take on the sin of the entire world and to do it all alone. For the past 24 hours, Jesus has had to endure the unimaginable. And now, on top of all that, to be without his father. I can't begin to comprehend what that must have been like. For Jesus, for us, Jesus was made sin and a curse. This was not the cry of a complaining servant, but the sob of a broken-hearted child asking, where is my father when I need him? It's hard for us to understand this mysterious transaction between the father and his son, the almighty God giving his beloved son for the sin of the world. A holy, righteous, just, pure God could not look on his son taking on the sin of the world, and so he had to turn away. Jesus did all this so that we would never have to experience that separation from God. What love, what grace, what a savior. At this time, I'll turn it over to some special music from Paul Dumb. Okay. Hi, everybody. Maggie and I'd like to play a hymn. Uh, I'm sure you know, if you have your red hymnal, it's number 316. I'll just read the first verse. Let's request on you. Oh, sacred head, now wounded. I had it on it, and I pressed it. And shame weighed down. Now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does that visage languish, which once was bright as morn. O sacred head now wounded.
I thirst, he cries. Hanging on the cross, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, calls for a drink. Jesus, who told the Samaritan woman at the well that he could give her water such that she would never thirst again, is himself thirsty. Jesus, who said to the crowd on the last day of the Feast of Booths, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, is himself thirsty. Of all that Jesus says from the cross, this statement strikes me as the most human, the most mortal, the most relatable. He experienced all that we experience. But Jesus and scripture itself teaches us to relate our feelings of physical thirst to a deeper spiritual reality. We thirst for meaning. We thirst for purpose. We thirst for connection with God. In these last moments on the cross, Jesus experienced being forsaken by God, the experience that we deserved. And he experienced the physical thirst that reflected the, the spiritual reality that he so often taught about. On the cross, he is poured out like water. Soon after, he is dead. And a Roman soldier pierces his side with a spear. And what comes out is not only blood, but also water. Water pours from Jesus' side like it pours from the rock in the wilderness, which, when Moses struck it, produce water for the people. Water pours from Jesus' side like the river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. Water poured from his side on that day, and it is still poured out today onto all who believe. We who believe are called to produce fruit by the gift of that water pointing the world to that future reality when, as it says in the Revelation, they will hunger no more, neither thirst any more, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. I give it over to Joel Leininger. The sixth proclamation of Christ on the cross did not focus on his suffering. It did not concern his humiliation and pain. It did not center on his separation from God, but instead was about us and our sin. He cried out, it is finished. And by that, he was referring to the accomplishment of two great reasons for his becoming man and living among us. The first is that his death was a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a, a $5 word that means averting God's anger by an offering. God cannot abide sin. It is, it's an affront to his very nature. Because God is holy, sin cannot be tolerated or excused. It incurs the wrath of God, an unpleasant subject on which to dwell. And so in the modern church, we speak at length about God's love and forgiveness and about his mercy toward us. But we say little about his righteous anger at our sin. That this wrath is a necessary consequence of it. The penalty for sin is death. That's been true since Adam and Eve. As a consequence, all through the Old Testament, God's people offered animal sacrifices to avert God's anger at their sins. Sacrifices that had to be repeated again and again because they didn't take away the sin, they merely covered it. But as Christ finished his work on the cross, he became the ultimate atonement for our sin. He was carried away forever. 
the animal sacrifices of bulls and goats as a covering for sin are, are no longer necessary. The ceremonies, including the great day of atonement, are relegated to history. Christ was the supreme sacrifice, once and for all, as a lamb without blemish or spot. The terrible wrath of God, which we deserve to suffer because of our sin, was directed to Christ instead. And now we are covered in a robe of his righteousness, as Isaiah writes. The hymn writer exclaims, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The second great work of Christ's death on the cross was the completion of his redemptive work. To redeem means to rescue from bondage or to buy back. Man's standing before God had been lost in the fall at Eden. The vital relationship between God and his creature had been severed. Communion between the creator God and his created being, man, had been ruptured and broken. Adam and his transgression had brought about spiritual death, not only for himself, but for all his descendants as well. Sin affected all of creation. So not only was the relationship between God and man broken, but the relationships between man and nature and between man and his fellow man, men were broken as well. Centuries passed until Jesus, the Christ, was born in Bethlehem. The eternal broke into time. The Son of God became man. He became flesh in order to redeem man, to, to buy back man, and to restore the broken fellowship between God and us. Matthew records Jesus saying, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in Luke, Jesus is quoted saying, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That redemptive work is done. Having been completed by Christ in paying the terrible price for us on the cross, redeemed. Fanny Crosby wrote, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child, and forever, I am. It's finished, indeed. Nothing can we add to or subtract from his work. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The propitiation and redemption were accomplished, and our standing with God secured for all eternity. Thanks be to God. And now Russ Wernick, speaking on Christ's last word on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, unto your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. What, in great, what a great and wonderful testimony we've heard this evening. The various thoughts shared by each one as they consider Jesus' words spoken from the cross. Many times the word love was used tonight, his love for us. We were challenged to regularly examine our hearts. We heard the hopeless have hope, the hope provided by Jesus Christ. My hope is this service has touched you as it has touched me and has encouraged you to delve into God's word more frequently. Encounter his great and wonderful promises and see and feel his everlasting love towards us. Well, that hard scene at, at Calvary is finally coming to an end, at least from a human viewpoint. The spectacle, as some in attendance would see it, accomplished their selfish agenda to continue their religious leadership over the Jewish people. They claim to have no king but Caesar. Those who had loved and followed Jesus, they couldn't believe what was happening to such a wonderfully kind and loving person, a great teacher. 
one who healed the sick, fed the hungry, turned water into wine, commanded the wind and the waves to be still. He didn't deserve to be treated like this. Even though Jesus said again and again that it would happen this way. Could this happen to God? And those shepherds, remembering the angel that appeared in the field some 30 plus years ago. Their great fear that night quickly diminished when the angel spoke and proclaimed good tidings of great joy, saying, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the multitude of heavenly hosts appeared, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. A Savior? The air is filled with his final words, as Jesus proclaims to his Father, Unto thee I commit my spirit, acknowledging publicly with his last breath the full measure of trust that his Father will do as he promised his Son. And just as Jesus had done, as he had promised his father to be a sin offering for the sinner, the ones of undeserving of such an immeasurable gift. You know, it's great to hear a message containing words spoken by great theologians, such as Charles Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis. Tonight, I wanted to do something different and share with you the responses I received from this question. If you could say one thing to someone on Good Friday, what would it be? Here are the 10 replies I received. Today, God proved his love for you. He made it real. Another, it's one of the two best days in the history of mankind, the other being Easter. But there's no Easter without Good Friday. It is the day when the course of mankind was changed from sure judgment to possible justification. That justification limited only by the willingness of the individual to yield to the wooing of the Spirit of God by faith. Another, Jesus was crucified for the forgiveness of your sin because he loves you. And another, no matter how many sins you commit, or have how bad the sins are, Jesus can forgive them all. Again, take a good look at what Christ endured for a bunch of worth, worthless sinners. It's all about the cross. Another, Sunday is coming. It's great that we know the end of the story. Good Friday is good because the punishment was accomplished on our behalf. There is nothing left for anyone to do except to believe this is true. Today represents the, the day Jesus died, which was the act he gives all peoples the opportunity to be forgiven of sin for eternity. Another said, there's brighter days ahead. And finally, the cross is God's final answer for sin, all caps. Jesus died on the cross to provide the way for us to receive forgiveness from our sins. Christ's death means that we are guaranteed forgiveness of sin when we accept Jesus as Lord. We brothers and sisters can rest assured on this Good Friday that we in the Lord Jesus Christ will also partake in his blessed hope, that great gift of salvation that he purchased for us that day. Good Friday wasn't the end of the story. The Father and the Son are no longer apart, but again, together for eternity. Now let's join for him, and afterward, Tom will share before we close. May the Lord bless you and keep you this day. On a hill far away, Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross With 
the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crime To the old rugged cross I will lay Shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross. trophies at last I lay down and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown I will cherish the old At last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross Exchange it someday for a crown. Thank you to uh, each one of the presenters, both the speakers and the musicians. A special thank you tonight goes out to Bill Dunkerton. Bill has managed the technology without which this meeting would not be possible. The Apostle Paul wrote uh, concerning Aquila and Priscilla that he gives thanks to them. He didn't say that he gives thanks for them, but he said that he gives thanks to them. And so Bill, tonight, we all give thanks to you for making this happen. I want to end our meeting tonight by looking forward uh, together to Easter Sunday and to uh, remember the words of a man named Carl Johnson. Carl and uh, Eleanor Johnson were among the great missionaries of the 20th century. Some of you uh, knew him. Some of you knew him very well. Uh, they were from Baltimore, and they went on the mission field in Africa to serve in Burundi right after the Second World War. And they stayed there for more than 50 years. Carl died there, and his children and his grandchildren still serve as missionaries in Burundi and in Tanzania. I met Carl only a few times when he would come back to America on furlough. And his heart and the heart, of an, and the heart of an evangelist were captured in words that he would say about that scene at Calvary. The character in the gospel accounts, other than the Lord, that he would sometimes comment on was not one of the disciples. It was not 
Pilate or Simon of Cyrene, but the one that we usually call the other thief, the one who blasphemed Jesus and said, if you are the Christ, save yourself. That guy usually doesn't get much attention. That guy is usually lumped in with the bad guys of the story. But Carl would say, don't give up on him. We know one was saved. And don't give up on the other thief. Because after those words in Luke 23, 39, he still had more than three hours. Three hours with Jesus. Three hours very close to Jesus. Three hours and more with the testimony of someone who now believed. And as Joshua has just told us, he wanted to be saved. And salvation was right there. It was so close. And Carl was hoping to find that blaspheming thief in the resurrection and to hear the story of his salvation. Now it's pure speculation. But he would choose to speculate that God's salvation would reach even that man, would reach him even then. And if God's grace didn't give up on him, then Carl wasn't going to give up on him either. And so should we as we prepare for this Easter Sunday. And so should we as we prepare for every Sunday, praying for and anticipating and anxious to see the salvation of the Lord further extended, that many would hear and, and believe and be saved. So let's look forward together to this Resurrection Sunday. Let's look forward together when we can meet again in our churches. And let's look forward together to Good Friday next year in the will of the Lord, which will be at Genesis. You don't miss your turn to host. It's just postponed. Let's pray. And then our meeting, and then we'll close our meeting. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the fellowship that has bound us together. And as tonight, we have remembered him. Lord, we pray for the gospel as it goes out this week. It goes out in different ways this week than in past years. It's going to go out in meetings like this. It's going to go out in drive-in churches. It's going to go out through through, uh, through, through, through broadcasts and, and over the internet. Lord, we pray that however your word goes out, that your spirit follows it and that your spirit anticipates it and that hearts would be opened and that people would be saved. We pray, Father, that you would bless each of the churches that are represented in our meeting tonight. That each church would be strong, would be unified, would be bound together in love as we, we strive together in the gospel. And Lord, we give thanks for your son. And we pray that his glory and his fame would continue to grow even during this time. And so we look forward anxiously to what you will do and give thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. The Lord bless you and keep you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay in the grace of the Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus, and we will see each other soon. Good night.